Dr. Ellison. He's from Marshall University. He's the director of Marshall. And we're very, very pleased and honored to have him here with us uh, as our keynote speaker. Dr. Ellison. Thank you very much. Thank you. For those of you who didn't see my initial gaffe, I stood up as I'm being introduced. My soda top fell on the floor, went across the aisle. I was afraid I was going to rip my pants, bending over to get it. <laughs> but I didn't, so it's good. Thank you for, thank you for coming this morning. Um, we're excited to be here from uh, Marshall University, the West Virginia Autism Training Center is uh, located there and we'll talk in a few minutes about that but I want to mention first that I'm here with colleagues uh, Tara Davis here, uh, Andrew Nelson who will be speaking today on different topics these guys are your real presenters it's uh, these guys are, are really why you're here today and uh, Joy Haynes is here from uh, some of you may know Joy from the training center Joy works Joy works uh, near, in a nearby region and pick up in here occasionally and uh, uh, we're glad you came up to lend some support we appreciate it um, and thanks to all the sponsors the Bavarian Inn was awesome I, uh, who stayed at the Bavarian Inn before it's a strange thing to ask locals I know why would you stay at the Bavarian Inn but, but uh, it was awesome it was the first time in my life I've ever had to use a ladder to get into the bed bed was, I'm a bit claustrophobic and I was a little worried that it was going to be too close to the ceiling, but I got through that okay, but the, I couldn't get over the ladder. I actually had to climb into the bed. Uh, it was interesting. A little, uh, little insight into my neuroses before we start. Um, I want to talk briefly about the West Virginia Autism Training Center because I think that in terms of uh, um, in terms of this region of the state in particular, I think there's, there, we've been, we've been uh, kind of invisible lots of times, or at least very quiet in the area. And we're trying very hard to, to make sure that people understand some aspects about our agency for referrals and for services. Uh, even though we're located, our, even though our primary office, and I'm, I'm reluctant to use that word, is located at Marshall University in Huntington, we're a statewide organization. So for instance, uh, uh, we have folks who are working out it in different regions of the state. Tara, for instance, is someone who, who lives here in Martinsburg and, um, and, uh, and works out of this region. And we have an office, uh, um, what street is it on, Andrew? Albert. Albert Street, where, where hopefully um, it's primarily a place for folks to come and, and uh, and uh, you know, make materials and, and copies and things like that. We're hoping in the next year or so it's, it's being used for skill groups and things like that, much more active. But, but these are some of the services that we provide at the Autism Training Center. Uh, do a significant amount of, uh, of uh, when you register for services, we do a significant amount of loaning out of library resources. We have a tremendous, um, tremendous library. In Huntington we have a uh, an autism rally, a walk that raises several thousand dollars for us a year. We put almost all of that money into library needs, so it's a really uh, state-of-the-art, up-to-date library that folks can use for free. We have a uh, we have uh, family coaching sessions if someone registers and needs uh, coaching, for instance, on, on topics like IEPs or behavioral support. Uh, about a 90-minute coaching session we provide folks for free. We have uh, we have special topics workshops and guest lectures throughout the state throughout the year. One of the primary, in fact, the, probably the, the, the most statewide service we have is the family-focused PBS intervention model. And we have, uh, we have staff regionally uh, throughout the state who work with, in total, about 100 families a year. And it's a 10-month program that's designed to, um, designed to uh, get at uh, positive behavior support plans help uh, build communities around individuals with autism and uh, and and by 10 months after we leave uh, leave a, a, a well-formed community uh, around the individual uh, in 2002 we started uh, the first uh, university-based program for supporting students with Asperger's disorder at Marshall and that's a on-campus only uh, program that we provide. Uh, we started with one individual and did that program for a year. 
today, in this fall, we'll have 53 students uh, that we're supporting on campus, all going through typical, traditional college experiences, living in dorms, if they want having roommates, or uh, uh, taking typical classes, graduating with a traditional degree. We have a, we're really proud of this. We have about a 94% success rate of individuals who become part of our program. They either graduate or are on track to graduate, and that's a really high number. When we started that program in 2002, we set 20 as the maximum student we would ever uh, serve. And then we got to 21, and then we got to 30. And the need is just incredible across the country. Uh, several programs like this we've helped develop uh, across the country, but uh, they're just not there. So uh, uh, probably less than a dozen type programs like that in the country. So Marshall gets a lot of attention for that. And uh, we're involved with uh, the Autism Spectrum Disorders Registry. Who knows about the registry? The registry is a, is a legislated uh, uh, thing that's housed at the university. Uh, autism uh, is a uh, reportable condition. Uh, there's no identifying uh, individuals in the registry. There's no, uh, it's just simply a count uh, and where and the location. Uh, that is, but, but uh, we're always trying to make sure that doctors and psychologists understand that if they're given out a diagnosis for the first time, they're obligated by law to report that to the registry. <coughs> I think that I'm trying to be thoughtful of the God video, video in the presentation, so I'm doing okay so far. Yeah. Um, I think that in framing my discussion today, it's important to you for me to mention kind of where my mindset is. When I started working in the field in 1985, how old were you in 1985? You weren't born yet. You know what was cool was that it used to be that when I would say that, people would say three or four. Now I'm getting all of this, I wasn't born yet stuff. And it, it makes me very sad. <laughs> when I started working in the field in 1985, I was fortunate enough to work with Dr. Ruth Sullivan. Does anybody know Dr. Ruth Sullivan, that name? No. Who knows her? Let's call us a couple nods. Yeah, you've heard of her. Well, it makes me sad that more people haven't. Ruth Sullivan uh, was, was a pioneer in the, in the, uh, in the field of autism. Uh, she, um, she developed a lot of what you see in IDA, for instance, uh, uh, classroom aids, aids on buses. She was someone who went to Washington and helped write the legislation for that. Uh, those kinds of things she absolutely included in the, in the language and, and got them approved. She was the first president and one of the founders of the Autism Society of America, primarily because she was a public health nurse with a and, her, and the sixth of her seventh children in 1960 was diagnosed with autism. And when she said uh, to the person, to the doctor in 1960, can you give me a book or something to read about this? He said, uh, don't waste your time, you wouldn't understand it anyway. She decided to get a doctorate. She realized, she thought for, for her, she needed to, to, to have a doctorate in order to get people to listen to her. But everything that she did was designed uh, from the perspective of the mother of, a, of an individual with autism. She was, a, she was the primary um, consultant for the film Rain Man. In fact, uh, Rain, the character Rain Man was a composite of three individuals, one of whom was her son Joseph, who's in Huntington. And Rain Man premiered in Huntington. Dustin Hoffman and Barry Levinson and those guys came. I was about a 20-year-old kid that was slightly involved and much more awestruck and we had a benefit and the benefit went to buying uh, a home in the Huntington area where her son lived and I was going to manage that home and uh, and I did for for six or seven years and when I we spent uh, we spent about 15 months planning this process down to we bought this really nice home uh, I gutted it uh, for, we bought it for, for very cheap, gutted it, redid the inside, 
we hired 15 brand new people out of college who had no reference for what a group home felt like or what uh, very much about autism and we spent months doing training with them about what we wanted to do and very person-centered kinds of things. And this is a picture of the move-in day in December, late December, uh, December 30th, I think, 1988, I believe. And that's me. I'm afraid to push buttons on this. Does this have, yeah, that's me right there. You can't see it, thankfully, because I have a mullet. <laughs> Do you know what a mullet is? Okay, all right. You've seen pictures in the history books? Yeah. I have a mullet. Now, my hair's not that cool today, but... Anyway, so I'm helping Joseph there move his, uh, his um, chair into his room. This many years later, if you went to Joseph's room in that home, it's still, the chair is still in the same spot uh, that it was uh, the day we moved it in. Um, Dr. Sullivan was incredibly uh, sad that evening. And I remember sitting around at... Uh, about 8.30 or 9, and all of the moving, moving was done. Uh, people were getting settled, and she's very teary-eyed. And I couldn't understand that at 19 or 20. It made very little sense to me that we spent so much time, months and months planning this, and it went perfectly. Joseph was happy. We spent, we spent months helping him transition into the home. He was comfortable there. And I was so proud of that, that I couldn't understand her sadness. So uh, I said to her, after everybody cleared out, um, why are you so sad? Uh, it's, it's a good day. It's a, everything that you've worked for and, and, and hoped for came true today. And she said this to me. You can't read it, I'll read it to you, I apologize. But she said, you're a nice young professional and I trust you. And by the way, I can hear her voice. That's almost an exact quote. I can hear her voice still in the moment uh, saying this to me. You're a nice young professional and I trust you, but tonight you'll sleep well knowing you did a good day's work. I won't because I know that when Joseph sleeps, he tends to pull his blankets too high toward his head and his feet are exposed. His feet get cold, but he doesn't think to cover them back up. So each night I do that for him until tonight. Instantly, the, my paradigm on how services should be provided flipped, instantly. That was a powerful moment in my life where I realized the, the difference between, I was, a, I was a young kid, but I had been involved with, with people that really pushed me to be a good professional early on. And I was proud of that. I was sensitive, I was thoughtful, I was attentive. But what I didn't have was an understanding from a parent's perspective about what it's like to live with an individual with autism, what it's like to deeply care for that person. I loved Joseph as much as my family. I didn't love him as much as his mother does, however. And because of that, that changed uh, exactly how I provided services. As we're going through today, I'd kind of like you to keep in mind this quote, uh, because everything that we're going to talk about for me, when you're talking about supporting folks with autism, is really about the relationships. Um, you're going to hear some really good technical stuff later, and these these guys are are going to are going to give you absolute. Not, and I'm going to talk about some strategies that are going to be really helpful. But unless you have the relationship with an individual uh, that you're supporting, those strategies are probably not going to be very effective. Does that make sense? By the way, you'll edit out all of the drinks of Diet Coke I have. So. All right. It'll be a lot. I'm also going to talk a little bit before we get into autism about some things that I think we have to get better at when we're developing relationships. And in human services, and by the way, I'm including education in human services. I'm including uh, uh, residential supports. I'm, I'm including... Uh, case management or service coordination type things, anything that your job requires you to provide support to another person is. I, I am including this. And I think that there are lots of mistakes we make in human services. Several years ago when I started doing, uh, doing uh, direct uh, training for direct care staff in residential settings, 
I put together a list of the mistakes I made in my, in my life because people shouldn't have to make the same mistakes that I made and I've made every one of these. And I think the important thing for me is understanding how our perceptions about individuals affect outcomes. I think uh, uh, Carolyn spoke very, uh, in a very poignant way about the comment that the person made to her about her child. Uh, and that person who made the comment was, was trying to be helpful and thoughtful. And, um, but the perception that she has changes everything. There's no doubt that person on the phone would be kind and considerate about other people. But, it, but to me, that person truly wouldn't be able uh, to provide a lot of support and, and, uh, because he truly isn't, isn't tuned in to the fact that individuals uh, with any kind of differences can lead uh, a life of quality. One of the things that we do in, in, in our support of people with disabilities in particular is we tend to talk about the person in front of them a lot. In residential settings, I've been in school systems where it happens, especially, and I think there's a, there's a, a specific connection between how uh, challenged an individual is with communication and how, more, how much the person talks about them. Show me your hand if you've seen people who talk about the individual in front of them as if they're not there. Why in God's name do we do that? Uh, we do that because over a period of time, by the way, I bet most teachers, most professionals don't do it on their first day. They do it over a long period of time where they become kind of accustomed to and, and content with uh, kind of poor communication that exists between the two. And there's a sense, of, I think there's often a, a, a dehumanization that occurs after that, a devaluing. And I don't think that it's intentional, and I don't think that it's purposeful, but I think it occurs. He doesn't understand anyone. In, in uh, behavioral health situations, I know that there's lots of times that, in fact, the place I used to work they had a requirement that an individual with autism had to sit in the back. He was incredibly uh, highly aggressive and, and working through lots of things and he would often uh, be physical, uh, physically aggressive with folks in, a, in the car. He had to sit in the back on the far right away from the driver anytime he was being transported away from somebody. He didn't talk, he didn't communicate very effectively at all. And what happened is that isolates the person. So rather than talking to the individual, the staff person would simply just turn on the radio. Get in the car, turn on the radio, drive the person around, and there was never any real interaction. No, no, no communication. No, hey, did you see we're passing the Dairy Queen, or it looks like a nice day outside. Talking about the person in front of them, talking at the individual is something that happens over a period of time when we just unintentionally, I think, devalue people. Um, as people. I think we do a really poor job tr uh, with transitional supports. I learned this really the hard way. I was managing a, a place one time that had uh, some really challenged folks with autism there and one guy in particular, he was in a, they were, these were adults, one in particular was frightened of, frightened of uh, hospitals. Uh, it, it took, it took uh, weeks to transition him in. It took multiple people to go with him to doctor's offices. It was really a problem. One day I realized uh, for our, our, the cook at our place said to me, we're out of something for dinner. And I'm sure it was something like important like oregano. You can't cook without oregano. Do you know this in your young life? It's an essential thing. So I said to the person that was working with, let's call him Frank, uh, hey, won't you run up to Kroger, pick up some oregano, and come back? And he said, okay. And it was simple as this. Um, hey, Frank, grab your coat and take a drive. Well, what we hadn't really thought about was how poorly we were helping him transition. That sudden, hey, let's go, was a challenge. That uh, change of routine was a challenge. And Kroger is, share, shares a parking lot with Cabell Huntington Hospital, where... Uh, some of you gasped, so you understand how challenging that was at the moment. He's, as he's getting closer to the hospital, he starts rocking, I'm told, uh, more and more uh, aggressively as he's, as he's uh, getting into the parking lot. When he gets into the parking lot, 
he raises his two feet up and kicks out the windshield of the car. By the way, if you don't want to continue on an outing of any kind with somebody, kick out the windshield. It's really, it stops the whole thing. Nobody continues with their day once the windshield has been kicked out. Um, so they came back. My staff's freaking out because his windshield's kicked out. Frank goes in, relaxes, and decompresses in his room. And immediately we start thinking, what did we do wrong here? It wasn't him. The problem wasn't that he kicked out the car window. That was an outcome of the problem. The problem was we didn't provide the transitional support for him because we didn't think about it. It was just something at that point in my career, wasn't, I wasn't as in tune as I needed to be with that, and neither was the staff with him. I think we do a lot of forcing our own values into individuals, and I think we do that not only uh, in human services, we do it in, in uh, uh, classrooms as well. Uh, thinking about the, per the disability uh, really before the person, it really sounds trite to say, but if you have a this person first uh, thing that uh, mindset where the disability might flavor how you interact with a person, as opposed to thinking about the disability first, it changes how you interact with people. It changes how you develop relationships with people. And then not having a true understanding of autism spectrum disorders, I think creates uh, significant havoc for individuals with autism and those who are supporting them. I think it's one of the biggest challenges that exist in education and, and, and support services just truly not understanding the condition. How many of you heard, for instance, people say that a student tests other people? New teacher, the new teacher is coming in for the day and, and somebody gives her a warning that says, be careful about Tommy, he'll test you for weeks, right? How many of you know the term executive functioning? How many of you know the term theory of mind? Some of you do, and uh, later I might ask some of you to tell me what it means, but we'll see. But if you don't understand executive functioning and theory of mind concepts, then it probably looks like somebody's testing you. It may look like somebody's unmotivated. It may look as though someone is um, uh, disorganized. And if they just, how about this one? Especially kids with Asperger's syndrome. If he just tried harder, he could get it, right? In the last 10 years, I've worked primarily with folks with Asperger's disorder, and I hear one consistent theme when people are transitioning from high school to college. And I got to the, I heard this so many times that I started asking every single person that I met. The story is that people with Asperger's syndrome often do their homework, put it nicely in their backpacks, take it to school, have it ready to turn in, but when the teacher says, it's time to turn in your homework, they don't turn it in. Now, for fun, show me who knows that story. It happens unbelievably. I bet, I bet nine out of 10 folks with Asperger's syndrome I know of me. Why do you think that happens? Shout out, somebody. Okay, so the direction may, may not have been good enough or explicit enough, good. What else? I started asking people that in, when they come to in our college program, for instance, we get, uh, we get about 100 applications a year. We end up taking 10. We select, the, we select 30 people and interview them and take 10 out of that 30 every year. I started asking each single person that question. Why do you not turn in the homework? And every single person tells me one of two reasons. Two, I've heard two reasons. Number one, I think they're both really the same reason. Number one, I'm overwhelmed with anxiety. When the teacher announces the homework, I become swollen with anxiety, overwhelmed with anxiety, and I can't plan what to do. I just freeze. Does that sound familiar to some of you? The other is, uh, and it's more rare, but I've heard this answer, I don't want the teacher to judge me. I don't want the teacher to judge my work, which really relates back to anxiety. I'm nervous about somebody making a judgment about me. Now, it may look like the person is disinterested. It may look as though the student is, is disorganized, 
But really, I think that's, a, that's an issue related to executive functioning, that, uh, that, he, that he or she can't regulate the anxiety that, that, that happens, and they just end up kind of becoming emotionally paralyzed. If you don't truly understand that, then you're going to take a different route in terms of providing support for them. And I think uh, in, in, in the support of human beings, we have people who develop relationships deeper if they're not paid to do it in some ways. Do you think that's, those people are paid to hang out together? Paid to hang out together? When I was managing group homes for Autism Services Center in Huntington, I would often go to Ritter Park. Is anybody familiar with Huntington? Ritter Park's a nice park system in, in town and um, everybody kind of goes there. And sometimes for a couple hours, I would go and sit on a bench where no one could see me and I would watch people walk this mile long lap around Ritter Park. I got to the point that I could tell who was a human service worker based on watching them walk with people. Human service workers walk like this. They walk dis in, a, in a kind of a, a distance from the person that they're paid to take care of. Um, they often, it might be three or four feet, but they're walking behind them generally or to the side or sometimes on their phone while they're doing it, but there's very little, dis there's very little connection. People who are walking because they enjoy walking together and develop a relationship with each other look like that. Am I lying? No. And, and I, think that, I think that what we have to do in, in the support of folks with autism is make sure that we're getting to that deep level right there. And you do that by being thoughtful, you do that by being attentive, you do that by analyzing your own behavior and yourself and your understanding. If I were an individual with autism, I would prefer that to that. As an individual without autism, I prefer the first to that. Human beings prefer the first to that. And I think our language uh, is an important component in developing relationships with folks that have autism spectrum disorder. Does anybody know the term person first language? I think that's an older concept now, but I think it's still an important one to continue to talk about. By the way, lots of times people get angry at folks like me who talk about person first language and say that's all politically correct. I don't care. Don't care. If politi politi political correctness to me simply suggests that we're being thoughtful of other people and, and that we interact with. I, what's wrong with that? And what's wrong, wrong with reminding people that thoughtfulness for other people is a good thing in our society? So, <clears throat> we talk about people, for instance, who have autism rather than have, uh, are autistic or an autistic person. Now, there's an interesting thing going on with folks that have uh, autism spectrum disorders where they often use the term autistic to describe themselves. I got no issues with that. You can use whatever term you want to describe yourself. But I think in terms of paid professionals especially, we have some due diligence to be thoughtful about people that we're supporting. And I think phrases like this, meds, have to be taken out of our vocabulary. Real quick, uh, my thought about meds, for instance, and kind of the language that we use is that we often give medicine to people that we love and we give meds to people that we're paid to take care of. Anybody here a nurse or a doctor? Okay. You may be an outlier here, but I think most people who don't interact in the medical field give their children medicine. I've never heard my wife, me, other people that we interact with, when their kids say, I've got a headache or I've got the flu, I've never said the phrase, let me go get your meds. Have you? Who's got kids and you say the word meds? It's okay. 
But we use the word meds as a derogatory kind of term, even if we don't intend it to be that. It's shorthand for there's a real problem with you. And by the way, we often use meds when they're, when they're problem behavior. Nobody ever talks about meds when things are going really well. It's either he's off his meds, his meds have changed. If you really get at the nuts and bolts of this language, it's a dehumanizing kind of concept that we're using. We're, we're creating a, a, an unequal balance in terms of people that we care about and love who get medicine. And by the way, nobody ever says, uh, boy, she, she has the flu and she was doing really well, but her medicine has been changed. And all. you don't really talk about that much. You just talk about the progress that's happened. You don't talk about the med change being the issue. Does that make any sense? Uh, there'll be some more examples on here, but that, that one to me is the, the one. We give, we give meds to people that we're paid to care for. I didn't ask earlier, but how many people are here are involved in the school systems? Teachers or paraprofessionals? And parents of individuals with autism or others? Did I miss something? Mental health? Hey, how you doing? I think in terms of, of, uh, of what I see our roles, and I'm including me in all of your categories, because I think I'm generally, generally involved with, with that, is that, is that your job really isn't to help a student recover from meltdown. It's to anticipate the potholes that cause the meltdown and then help them create a safe and effective path around them. There are, there are gonna be potholes in life. And the first thing that I think in supporting individuals with autism that you can understand that would make your life easier and your job easier is just not get bummed out that somebody hit a pothole because guess what? They're gonna hit one today, they're gonna hit one tomorrow, and everybody else is too. We all are. Earlier today, we showed up early to get our equipment set up. There was no sound on the, on the thing. On the inside, there was no sound coming out. We had to figure out a different way of doing it. On the inside, I'm freaking out. Uh, this guy, Joey, right? Joey and Andrew solved it without a problem, uh, with a couple of, uh, couple of things to do. But it was, it was the, it, we figured out how to easily go to plan B. By the way, he was able to fix that because Andrew uh, thoughtfully uh, put everything on another hard drive and had it in his pocket ready in case there was something to go wrong to switch it to a different computer. He anticipated that pothole would happen and uh, yes, get a pat on the back, Andrew. <laughs> he anticipated that pothole and had a plan B in his pocket just in case. And how many times do we get so frustrated about when plan A doesn't work? We hit the pothole, somebody hits the pothole, and it just ruins everybody's day. Well, embrace the fact that potholes are going to happen. And the key is anticipating where they're going to be. <laughs> so as we talk a little bit about autism spectrum disorders, I often use this picture to, to kind of get at a, at a sense of kind of what, in an observational way, autism might look like. I love this picture. There's so many things about the picture that remind me of autism spectrum disorders. What speaks to you from that picture about, uh, of autism? Yeah. In that moment, they're not communicating uh, with each other or anybody else. Yeah. Now, that's just a second in time, but my guess is that they're probably not the rest of the time either. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's, and, and, and there's no real joint attention of anything. The kid doesn't look like he's gonna pull the, the, the shirt of the guy and say, hey, look at that bird. That's not gonna, it doesn't look like it's gonna happen. Yeah. What else? In that picture, there's simply, there's, yeah, there's no, there doesn't seem to be any interest in each other. Yeah.
Okay. Yep. There are a couple of things that I think are really interesting about the picture. And, and, I, and I'll mention this, I appreciate the comments. I heard, I heard often interest. And I don't know how we gauge interest from that. For instance, it could be that they're very much aware and very much interested in what's going on. But uh, for whatever reason, uh, uh, biological or, or sensory based or uh, social communication reasons, are not tuned in in, in, the, in the way that we generally tune into things. Uh, lots of folks with autism, for example, look at things in a, from their peripheral vision much more than, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, which is, which is much more common than with girls, yes. But there are lots of social communication things going on that are interesting. For instance, the kid in the middle has, a, has a, a posture that's generally not the posture of a 10-year-old kid. He's got a posture of a 45-year-old man. That's me in that middle, in the middle thing. <laughs> By the way, 45-year-old men don't care how they look to other people. We're just happy to be comfortable. That's all we care about. We just want to be comfortable. 10-year-old kids want to look cool. So that they often don't look like their fathers do when they're sitting and watching TV. They're very thoughtful about, and that comes back to this concept that we'll talk about later called theory of mind, where you understand that people are making judgments about you. If that were a typical 10-year-old kid with really intact, fully developed theory of mind and, and, cons uh, uh, and uh, social communication skills, I doubt he would have that posture right there. Just this looks way too old for his, for his age. The other is, look at this. They're sitting on one end of the bench. Now, that's cute. Maybe they're friends, you might say. But we don't do that in our society. And if you don't believe me, how many times have you been at the mall during a holiday? Christmas time. You're loaded up with bags. You've been shopping for six hours. You're tired. And off in the distance, you see a bench with one guy on the left side. And you think to yourself, I'm gonna go sit on the, left, on the right side of that bench. There's a great place I can rest, right? But just before you get there, somebody sits on the right side of the bench. How many of you are gonna contend? How many of you are likely to go sit in the middle? How many of you are gonna wait till the next bench? Most of us? Yeah. We, now, why, you don't have to. Why do you do that? There's something in our, in our culture that just says that's not the, the best option to do, right? It's a last option if you really need it. But it's not, the, it's not the first option. Well, to these guys, it's a first option. They, nobody told them that. They didn't pick it up in our society that hasn't happened. So they're all jammed into this one side of the bench right here. Today, as we're talking through these things, I'm going to continue, even though the DSM-5 changed uh, uh, the d diagnoses from Autistic Disorder, Asperger's Disorder, and PDD and OS to Autism Spectrum Disorders and Levels, I'm going to continue to talk about these terms because I think that generally those are the terms still used in most school systems and uh, people who had those diagnoses, uh, diagnoses before retained them, so I'm going to continue to talk about them uh, through the course of the day. As we go through myths about autism, I think that uh, I'd like your comments about some of these if you, if you have them, so don't be shy to talk. But I think that we can learn a lot about supporting folks with autism by talking through some of the stereotypes that we uh, have about them. And one is that it's incredibly rare and easy to recognize. And I think that's probably a myth that's been busted up the last few years more so than than uh, maybe seven or eight years ago. But still, I think we, we find people who don't have great experience uh, with the, uh, someone on the spectrum, and they believe that, uh, that they can spot, and I was one of these people, uh, you can spot somebody with autism in a crap. Uh, I've learned over the last three or four years that that's not, uh, not as obvious as I thought used to think that it was. When I started in the field in 1985, 
it was somewhere, the prevalence was somewhere between four and five of every 10,000. Now the prevalence is, is one in 68. And that's amazing to me. Does anybody else find that amazing? Um, now, there clearly are some changes in terms of how the spectrum is diagnosed, and that clearly is gonna pull people in. There are, uh, there's greater awareness. In 1985, I kid you not, I had to spell autism once for a doctor. I'm not kidding you, in 1985. Um, that doesn't happen in really anymore. But the Center for Disease Control, uh, the person who did the study, the prevalence study, Catherine Rice, says that those things really don't make up the, the, high, uh, the, the reasons for the high spike, that something else is going on and we're just not sure what that is. But it's the face of autism is changing and I think that affects how we support them. For instance, Prior to Rain Man, kind of the face of autism was this, was this kind of uh, child in an institutional uh, kind of setting with, in a corner. In fact, and I mean no disrespect when I say this, this is a true story. The first time I ever heard the word autism was in a child development class in 1984, where the child psychologist said this phrase. Uh, it's hard for me to even say, but I'm going to say it. Those autistic kids are nuts. They sat in a room all day long, pulling out their hair, pulling off their own fingernails. Now everybody in the class kind of went, ugh. And I went, wow, that's interesting. Why would somebody do that? And I, it kind of piqued my curiosity, which led me to, 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 to be interested. Now I've talked to this professor since, and I've brought up the comment, which he didn't remember. But he remembered seeing one kid in one state institution one time in the early 1980s. So that was his frame of reference. For, for that, and he, and he just kind of broadly applied it to everybody. But that was, in the 80s, the idea of what a person with autism looked like. You said autism, that was the image that came up. And then in the late 80s, this uh, Rain Man character came out, and by the way, did nothing but wonderful things for the autism community. It was, it was to me, the hallmark of getting the word out in the public and getting people to understand at least some concept of that. What happened though was that everybody then thought all people with autism are savants. So you'd go say, my child has autism, or I'm, uh, in her, I support people with autism, and it was like, can he count toothpicks? Like, he probably can, but it's not that fast. <laughs> and now, now we have folks like this woman who's a banker, the mother of two, in a 15-year marriage and doing quite well. If you told me this woman existed in 1985, it would have made no sense to me whatsoever. It, my paradigm of what autism was was so narrow that it wouldn't have made sense. Now it seems an afterthought that people with autism could leave lead lives of quality, that they can marry, they can have deep relationships, they can have children, they can be successful in jobs. Most of the time, that's a no-brainer now. But it took, it took years to ex kind of expand what we know about the condition and who in, uh, fits into the condition to help us understand it. When you think about autistic disorder, and I'm really just going to spend a little time talking about autistic disorder and Asperger's disorder and the kind of the differences between the two. One of the things that's important really is to understand that there's a failure to develop peer relationships appropriate to the developmental level as part of, as a hallmark of the, of the condition. There's a real misunderstanding among diagnosticians about that. I know a couple of people even the last year that went to out of state to be diagnosed. I'll give you the, that, that this really played a role in the fact that they did not receive an autism diagnosis. One was a five-year-old child who <coughs> was being tested. And about 30 minutes into the test, his mother says, he reached up while she was beside him, beside him and hugged her. She patted him on the back 
helped to comfort him. He went back to the testing again. The doctor cited that, and the psychologist cited that uh, in the, in the uh, evaluation report and refused to give him an autism diagnosis because he was uh, socially appropriate with his mother, that he sought out a hug. That makes no sense to me. If you, and, and, and what happens is then people start to say things like, uh, you've heard people with autism don't need friends. They don't want friendships. They don't want to develop relationships. They're happy to be by themselves. I don't, I don't know anyone, any human being that prefers that. So you're going to have to prove to me each on an individual basis that's the case of a person with autism. In this case, the developmental level is the really important part. If the psychologist had simply asked his mother what he would have been told was that this five, she remembers only two or three other times in this five-year-old's life that he ever reached up to hug her. Is that developmentally appropriate for a five-year-old? Dear, dear God, when my kid's five, I can't get him off my lap, right? I'm like begging him to get off my lap. Quit trying to hug me all the time getting chocolate all over me. Yeah? And just, just to point out that, that also, that, that's not a pure relationship. Um, with your mother, your yeah, that's not, a, that's not a pure relationship, but, but it, what, yeah, and it's a good point to make, but what this guy was trying to point out though, however, was that, was that, uh, was that socially this kid needed his mom at that moment and was able to, to demonstrate that to her, and he thought that would then preclude a diagnosis of autism. All he had to do was ask the, ask the next couple of questions. He'd have recognized where that, how, how developmentally uh, poor that was. Also, uh, there are qualitative impairments in communication. And with autistic disorder, it's often a delay in or a lack of spoken language before the age of three. That's not the case with Asperger's disorder. With Asperger's disorder, there's, there diagnostically is no uh, qualitative delays in the development of language. That doesn't mean language isn't used oddly or unusually. Doesn't, need the, doesn't mean that the skill level doesn't have to be improved, but it means there's no delay in the development of language through the age of three. But still, diagnosticians miss this. Friday of last week, I met a person who was diagnosed with Asperger's disorder who didn't talk until he was five. Diagnostically, that's not, act, that's not possible because of the, of the communication delay. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, I got an evaluation at the training center from a psychologist who, who wrote in his narrative, um, this 14-year-old child who didn't talk until he was four uh, has a diagnosis of autistic disorder now, but I expect that one day he will become, uh, the diagnosis will be Asperger's disorder. Again, not possible, because diagnostically because of the, of the communication delay. So what people clearly are misidentifying is that uh, they, they believe that people with autistic disorder and Asperger's disorder are different cognitively. If they see a person who has, who's bright and uh, articulate at some point in their lives, they automatically assume that's Asperger's disorder, when really it doesn't, it doesn't have to be. And, 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 and to me, that causes lots of challenges for person who persons who live with autistic disorder. Let me ask you, who knows who Temple Grandin is? Everybody does now, right? Asperger's disorder or autistic disorder? Autistic disorder. But I saw, uh, I saw something uh, written in a paper the other day that identified her, I don't know, a few months ago, identified her as a as person with Asperger's disorder. Clearly not, and she will talk about that and say that. But because she has a PhD, and because she communicates effectively, people assume she has Asperger's disorder. And to me the issue is, how does that affect individuals with autistic disorder? People with Asperger's disorder, again, have a failure to develop peer relations at the developmental level. But it doesn't mean they don't want to. Again, I think that, I think wanting to and having the skills to do it are entirely two different things. 
and they have a preoccupation with an interest that's abnormal in intensity or focus. Now, this, this kind of abnormal fixation with kids that have autistic disorder is often about lining up things, right? Keeping things symmetrical. You give, you give a kid with autistic disorder 25 matchbox cars, they're probably gonna spend time lining them up in, in some kind of fashion. You give 25 matchbox cars to a kid with Asperger's disorder, they may go to Google and, uh, and uh, spend four or five hours looking up where those matchbox cars were made, how they relate to the real cars. Their abnormal kind of, uh, this, this, this intense focus is more on, kind of often on the educational side. I knew, knew a 13 year old kid once who taught himself Latin, literally. He just graduated from Marshall with a master's degree in physics. Unbelievably bright guy, but by 13 had taught himself Latin. Isn't that cool? On the surface, it's pretty cool. But if you're 13 and you teach yourself Latin, how many parties are you going to with your friends? How many times are you staying overnight with them? How many baseball games are you playing in with the kids in your classroom? Very little, and he would tell you none. Because he was so absorbed in, in learning this at that time that all the other stuff just kind of, kind of uh, went by the wayside. He wanted friends, he would tell you, but he didn't know how to interact with them and how to develop friendships. I thought years ago we wouldn't talk anymore about parents, uh, being, poor parenting being caused, uh, being as a, a cause for autism. But we're back to that again sometimes, way too often. Do you all know the term refrigerator mother? Andrew, would you give me a Q at like 1020? The 1020 Q. Who knows the term refrigerator mother? Okay. Can you give me a, an idea of what that means? Yeah. And because of that, the theory was, and this is a theory that went on through the 80s, a guy named Brutal Betelheim, who's a, who's a, a child psychiatrist, Whose, whose credentials in the last uh, 15 years have been put into question, seriously. But uh, became famous for this concept and he spent time in a Nazi concentration camp as a child and, and, and part of his theory was watching developed from that experience. But the idea was, yes, that, that mothers especially uh, became cold and withdrawn, didn't emotionally invest in their child, their child as a result became uh, uh, isolated and, and have autism. So in 1970, through the 70s, if you had a child with autism, what the treatment was that you place the child in the institution and then you get therapy for how to be a better parent. Now that made no sense to people like Ruth Sullivan, who I mentioned earlier, who I said earlier, her son Joseph was the sixth of seven children, none of the other of whom had autism. And she knew she didn't develop, treat him any differently than the others. So she, she and uh, 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 Bernie Rimland, Bernie Rimland uh, wrote the first book on uh, the fact that, and, and I think 1965, on the, on the idea that autism was a neurological disorder. But for years, this stereotype of a refrigerator mother existed. And let me tell you, it's coming back. It's coming back. Uh, as I think that for folks who are highly challenged, I think most people now don't think that. But as more and more highly independent folks uh, with, uh, with an autism spectrum disorder are living lives, going through kind of typical experiences, it's easy now to, to kind of say, oh, he could, if, he, if his parents were stricter on him, he would have done better. If he had more structure in his life, he'd do a lot better. If his parents had just whatever, he would have done a lot better. So the, I think the, there's a correlation between the more independent a person is and, 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 and this idea of blaming parents in some way for, uh, for any of their problems that exist. The reason I put this up here is that, well, there, here. Let me go to here first. This is uh, from an Indianapolis Star, October 2011. In Indianapolis, shorts, the short version of this is, a teacher duct taped a kid with autism to a chair. 
Does that get your attention? Duct tape a kid with autism to a chair. Tip the chair back so that he wouldn't har harm himself from flailing about. And left him there uh, while he was getting, having a tantrum of some sort. The parents rightfully sued the school system. And I think the judge wrongly said uh, they did everything they could with what they had. Uh, no basis for the lawsuit. Uh, we move forward. This is one of the letters in the Indianapolis Star that I was, as I was reading the story, this stuck me, struck me as, there were two or three letters. This one in particular struck me as, uh, as, as how our society thinks about the support and educational and care support of folks with autism. This person wrote, to me, autistic children are simply the result of bad parenting that left spanking children for misbehavior and instead adopted non-physical punishments, such as time out and other practices that create spoiled brats who act out because they know there's no real consequence for their actions. Just give me a nod if you've heard similar things in your life, right? This idea of blaming parents is really really just simply not understanding the condition. Dennis Leary, who I think is cool by the way, I like Dennis Leary, he's funny, but he wrote a book called Why We Suck in 2008, that's what comedians do, and in his book he wrote that autism is booming because parents want an explanation for why their dumbass kids can't compete academically so they run to psychologists. I don't give a blank what these crackerjack whack jobs tell you. Your kid is not autistic, he's just stupid. I was in Arlington, Virginia doing a conference the next day when, I, when this came out uh, on the news service. Uh, I changed the cover of my title from something like supporting students with autism to why Dennis Leary should die and go to hell. <laughs> and nobody else got it, but I did. It was, <laughs> now, um, again, I think that, I think this is really about people not truly understanding some of the more subtle aspects of, of the autism spectrum condition. Things like executive functioning. Theory of mind. Sensory processing and motor skill development. And we're gonna talk about those in depth here in just a few minutes. Individuals with autism, let me, let me run through here real quick to make sure I'm right. Yeah, yeah, we will. I'm gonna have to do it quickly though, I know. Individuals with autism test people or behave poorly and manipulate others. Uh, here to tell you it's not true. Executive functioning, which we'll talk about in a minute, is really about cognitive planning. It's about it's, it, it, co executive functioning are cognitions that help us do a variety of things. Uh, plan, organize, uh, control and inhibit ourselves, s regulate ourselves. How many of you, uh, who, who here is the best planner in the house. Who, who does planning? The, yeah, somebody, uh, yeah. Are you, a, are you such a planner that, that like your friends come to you and for help on like going on vacations and you've got a checklist and a to-do list and all that stuff? Yeah, yeah. And you're, I would guess that you're very linear in how you see things, just, just very specific and yeah. You're learning not to be, yeah. Dude, I, I'd like to be you I, when I grow up. I'd like to be that person. Sometimes I'm wrong about this, but usually not. Are you also somebody who um, is, uh, you, don't, you don't get angry fast. You might get angry and, and, and all of that normally, but, but you don't arrive at it quickly. You're more thoughtful about that before you get mad and throw something. Okay. That's, that's kind of a profile of somebody who has just, you know, well-developed kind of executive functioning uh, going on. But how many of you are like me who wake up on a Saturday, and I remember I remember being in college and waking up on a Saturday, and I don't know at noon, and uh, and my parents had a message on the voice answering machine that said, "Hey, we're going to come down. We'll be there in a couple of hours," and I freaked out because, you know, I may or may not have had beer cans all over the place. I may not have had other kind of things I didn't want them to see in the in the corner of the room. I had trash and laundry everywhere. Who here has had that experience where that is so overwhelming? You don't know where to, where to, what to do. You don't know the next step to take. So you do like I do, and you sit down, you watch TV. 
Does that make sense to some of you at least? Okay. By the way, what happens as we're talking through this later, what happens is that, is that that anxiety wells up and you can't plan, you can't organize. They're, they're, it's not as obvious. And so you can't go to a plan B. Uh, you sit down, you relax, the anxiety level drops. And then as it starts to drop, you start thinking, well, I could pick up the trash. I could throw the beer cans away. That's a good step. And then as the anxiety starts to reduce more, things become much more obvious. Well, if I just pick up the dirty clothes, it'll be okay too. That executive functioning really kicks in to help regulate the anxiety, reduce it, and choices become much more. Um, problems with executive functioning make me think that this myth that they test people or behave poorly manipulate is just BS. It's nonsense. Are you going to edit out the BS part for me, please? Uh, it's nonsense. Not only, I think, is it a neurological challenge for a person with autism to say, I can't wait till Mrs. Smith gets here tomorrow as a substitute because I'm really going to mess up her day. I'm going to see what I can get away with. I think, I think that's just not typically how people and human beings react, respond. I think instead what happens is that when you're new into a person's life, you don't know how to do the dance. You know what I mean by that? You don't really understand how each person jives and moves. Who here has been like me? Anybody, anybody like me and can't dance very well? Dance challenged? But I'm particularly dance challenged if it's a new person I've never danced with before. I don't know what the moves mean. I don't know how to mirror it. Should I mirror them? Should I have my own thing? Should I? It's a disaster. And I think we're all like that. I, I guarantee you no one here ever met a person at the mall, spent all day with them, and became their best friend. It takes time for relationships to evolve. And I think that's kind of what's going on rather than he's testing somebody. People with autism live in a world of their own can't stand the phrase. There are people that live in a world of their own psychologically, and those people have a mental illness. People with autism do not live in a world of their own. Now, it may look like they live in a world of their own. We may presume they live in a world of their own. But they're often very much aware of what's going on. But so much of what we do is about social communication. And that's such a challenge for folks with autism that I think it makes sense to think that. And here's, here's a quick example. Several years ago, and I always laugh about this because, and I shouldn't, it's going to make me look a little bit like a sociopath, I think it's funny. But probably 25 years ago, one of my really good friends was working with an individual very much like the Rain Man character. In fact, they're very, very similar in how they, how they see the world and how they interact. They were riding on, a, on bikes downtown at Huntington's River Park, uh, River Park uh, Park. And, uh, and my friend who does not have autism is, they're going fast and he's paying attention to the guy who does have autism but riding beside him and he's talking to him. And he runs into one of those chain link things that uh, you see sometimes at parks, right? Smacks it full force right into the thing. He's thrown off the bike. That's the part that I laugh at, and it doesn't, make me, it doesn't make me seem very sensitive. I apologize. His friend with autism kept on driving, kept on riding, <laughs> kept on going. So my friend Mike gets up and he dusts himself off. He's bloody and bruised, and he gets his bike up, and he finally catches up with Steve, and he says, Steve, did you not see me fall? And Steve said, yeah, I saw. He said, why didn't you stop? He said, I didn't think about it. Now, he clearly saw it. He wasn't in a world of his own. It may have looked that way. It may have looked like he was so into himself and his own world that he didn't know what was happening. He did. But knowing what to do in that situation is a social thing that you do. Think about it for a moment from kind of your everyday perspective. How many of you are driving along the interstate and there's a car on the side of the road that's got the hood up? Who stops? 
shame on you first. But second of all, are you all living in the world of your own? No, you clearly are aware of that, but what you're doing, I guess, but let me ask this question. Who feels bad sometimes that you don't stop? All right, because what you're doing is, you're going through your checklist of things that are socially acceptable, right? Is it a woman? Is it a couple of guys? Is the hood up, flat tire? What will happen if I do stop? What will happen if I don't stop? Will they be mad at me? All kinds of, what's the socially appropriate thing to do? And then, by the way, in our society today, we just keep on going. But nobody's in a world of their own. We're making, we're making judgments about what we're, what we're to do, and that's what Steve was doing. Steve saw the accident. He didn't know, he didn't have the skills, the social skills, to know what to do. So he did the only thing that he knew to do, which is keep on going. People with autism have intellectual disability. I, don't, I doubt anybody here truly believes that anymore, but it's still a stereotype that happens. I'm always surprised when somebody is surprised that 94% of the people in our college program graduate from college. Everybody, hears, everybody gets all excited about it. That seems, well, some of those guys have 140 IQs. They're going to they're gonna graduate college, right? Now, there may be challenges socially, but they're going to do okay academically. The new study that came out with the 1 in 68 prevalence said that 46% of people with autism have average or above average intelligence. That's huge. In the DSM-4, it literally said 75% of people with autism have mental retardation, which was the term used at the time. In the DSM-4-TR, the text revision, they took out the 74 or 5% and they put the majority of. And now we know that it's somewhere uh, at 46% do not. People with ASD have no interest in personal relationships. Uh, I'm not going to get to the end of my stuff. A lot of what we're going to talk about, these guys are going to talk about anyway, so we'll be fine with that. But So I'm going to spend a little time on this. This is Brandon here from Alabama. And this gets to the peer this gets to the peer relationship aspect that we're talking about earlier, they're developmentally appropriate. By the way, uh, Brandon came to me about four years ago. He's graduated now and lives out in Colorado. Brandon came to me four years ago and said, I hear that sometimes you go out and talk about college program that we have and you have pictures. And I said, I do. And he said, if I gave you a picture, would you include it in your presentation? I said, it depends on the picture, but probably. And he sends me this one. And I wrote back, dude, I will always put that in every <laughs> picture. I get it. I get it. Now, here's the part. I don't know if you guys know this. This is a college town, right? I, well, Shepherd's Towns. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you, I guess maybe you do know this. In college towns, uh, they have things called bars. And if you, if you buy people drinks in those bars, they will hang out with you all night long. Do you know this? Brandon discovered that. Now, here's the thing about Brandon. Brandon, Brandon spent at least one night hanging out with these girls. Doesn't know their name. Doesn't know anything else about them. But they stayed all night at Jake's, a block off campus at Marshall, while he bought rounds. That sounds exciting and interesting, and it kind of, the psychologist I mentioned earlier who doesn't think that people with autism have any social interest would say he doesn't have autism perhaps as a result of that. But at 18 years of age, Brandon in one month ran up a $1,700 uh, pause for effect, $1,700 bar tab. I'm a, I'm a little hesitant to ask this question because some of you may have college age children, but is that a developmentally appropriate thing to do for an 18 year old? It's not a smart thing to do, but it's probably not developmentally appropriate uh, for an 18 year old to do. And what we had to do then was help him understand different ways of, of, uh, of making those connections. We talked a little bit about executive functioning. One of the real significant problems with individuals that have autism, and I think if I had to make my own list of things that I think are 
problematic for people living with autism, this would be in the top three. Just the, just the overwhelming anxiety that happens and the real challenges with, with regulating that. Figuring out how to do a, having, having to have a plan B is unbelievably challenging sometimes. And I think that's where our support can come in best, is helping, is number one, recognizing that that exists, and then helping them to develop those things. Theory of mind is the other. There, there are several, uh, the theory of mind is debated in the field, but I'm, I buy into it completely. The, the concept that, that people, uh, um, ha the understanding that people have thoughts and opinions of their own that, that aren't necessarily yours. It's also about recognizing that people are making judgments about you. Um, for instance, the Rain Man poster is a beautiful example of theory of mind. Prior to the Oprah couch jumping thing that Tom Cruise did, he was a pretty hot guy, if I do say so myself. What's Tom Cruise saying with his posture and his clothing and the way he looks? Yeah. Yeah, he, yeah, he's comfortable in his own skin, confident. The message of all of that, however, is I'm the man. Not only do I know I'm the man, but I want you to know I'm the man, right? This theory of mind idea that I know you're looking at me, and here's my message. I always get a little insecure when I talk about Tom Cruise. <laughs> here's my message to you. And Raymond, however, doesn't seem to be to really be concerned about that. He doesn't seem to maybe be aware that uh, other people are making judgments about him. Raymond's dressed for himself. His Tom Cruise's character is dressed for other people. When you get up in the morning, I don't know if you know this or not, but you you generally dress for other people, right? And he is. Folks, folks without a really fully developed theory of mind are are dressed for themselves. We're going to skip the bathroom. Man, that's my favorite part, too. It is a good one. I'm going to end on that, OK? Uh, how many of you teach young boys with autism? How many of you have to do bathroom skills? How many of you are comfortable doing bathroom skills with boys? Yeah. What do you, what's, what's important to know about bathroom skills? Could you hit that, Andrew? Could you hit that video for me? What's important to know? Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's important. Okay. All right. Yeah. We use the hall bathroom and that we're working really hard on not yeah, my friend Peter Gerhardt begs people in conferences, quit teaching people to drop your pants. It's, a, it's, a, it's an invitation to be beaten up. Here's one thing that this is going to talk about this. Here's one thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beg you to take bathroom training seriously. It is the place that per, maybe more than any place else creates problems with reputation uh, among boys. Now, women in the audience, I'm guessing some of you may struggle with that idea because women's restrooms are a community. Is that right? Okay. Now, I know that some people are going to be, some people, this may not be always true, but, but in women's bathroom, you talk to each other, right? You're not opposed to sharing things. Your toilet paper's run out. Some of you will know that it's not unusual because I, I mean, I'm told I don't spend time in women's bathroom. <laughs> But I'm told that people say things like, hey, can somebody toss me some toilet paper over the stall or under the stall or whatever? That's normal. In a men's bathroom, you don't do that. Don't do it. Is that true? Am I lying? Not only do you not do it, but you find some alternative way not to talk. Uh, maybe, maybe you use a sock if you have to. I'm only half joking. You will do anything possible 
not to communicate with anybody else in the men's bathroom. Can it, seriously, give me an amen. Is that, is that not true? And, and the problem is, and I, okay, I'm talking about me and you. We're not going to have a sit down conversation in the men's room uh, at the break, are we? So, so what you have to do is understand some of the dynamics of a men's room when you do this. For instance, I'm, 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 I believe completely that men's urinals are designed by women. Okay, all right. Maybe it's a mad psychology experiment. <laughs> this is a funny way of looking at men's room, but I want you to pay attention to how, it's, even though it's a joke, I want you to pay attention to the dynamic that exists. And by the way, it's not for men, it's not about looking, just so women know. It's not about looking at other people's stuff. <laughs> it's much more subtle than that. It's a, it's a, it's a space issue, it's, a, it's a, a communication issue. If you look, at, if you look that's worse, but it's not really about that. It's just an uncomfortable place to be in and you wanna get in and get out as quickly as you can. Go ahead and show that. because it is a boundary. And by the way, what he's doing is really important. See how he's slightly turned away from everybody else? Yeah. Just to finish up on this, because this is really important, that, I mean, that's funny, but it's really true. How much time do we spend with young children, young boys with autism, teaching them to communicate with other people, reach out and talk to other people, uh, can, you know, make friends? Do we ever say, except in the bathroom? <laughs> so what happens then, you might have a 12-year-old kid with autism who's, who ponies up first to the, ponies up to the urinal. That's a new one for I, wonder, I, I have this I have this fixed interest in words I've never said before and I actually keep a list of them. Pony up to the urinal is going on the list. So. But how many times have we have we done that and you have a thirteen year old boy who walks up to the to the urinal, stands beside and says that, Hey Steve, how you doing? Reputation killer. In fact, it's such a reputation killer that I'm gonna suggest that, that kid might get beaten up on the playground later that day. The boy who doesn't have autism is going to be so frustrated, annoyed, intimidated, whatever, uncomfortable, that those things happen. And they happen more regularly than you would think. So some of that social uh, communication aspect, some of, that, some of the social understanding, you've got to build into that kind of teaching. I have run out of time, and I apologize. Uh, I'm going to be around, and the, the, some of the stuff that I did have at the very end were some strategies that I think are helpful. In, and uh, supporting students with autism. Uh, I think they're pretty self-explanatory. Um, if, if I'll be around the rest of the day if anybody has any questions, but I wanna keep you on time. So. You were a lovely uh, audience, thank you very much.